He didn't do away with the law. He fulfilled it and brought it to a higher level, the spiritual level, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of liberty. When that happened, the heavens were open to Jesus. And what happened? There was a, in the likeness of a dove descended from heaven. The Holy Ghost descended from heaven as a dove and rested upon Jesus. How God anointed Christ Jesus of Nazareth went about doing good, healing all manner of sickness and disease. It was only then fulfilling the high priest under the law that Jesus, as the Son of God, which is the Father manifest, could go out and do any works because now God had anointed him, fulfilling the law, and he has every right to do it. He has every right to do it because he's fulfilled his law at age 30. Exactly what the law said, the Lord God did it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Randy. Now, Jesus goes out for three and a half years. All of his miracles that he does, he starts out with healing Peter's uh, mother of a headache, of a fever. He heals her. Well, then what happens? That, that it progresses. The, the miracles progress. Everything he does, he's progressively glorifying his human. From glory. He's, he, now, why does he pray to the Father? Well, he's a man in our stead. He's still veiled and under the law. That law hasn't been fulfilled yet. That law has not been fulfilled yet. Amen. That blood has not been paid. Men can't get back to God. That price of blood hasn't been paid. And Jesus is the man that sacrificed. And he can't just walk up and say, hey, I'm going to die for all mankind. No, you've got to fulfill that law first. Why? Because you can't do away with the law until you fulfill it. In other words, if he can't fulfill the law, he's going to need a Savior to die for him. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he's going to fulfill the law in every, every respect, and then he has to be willing to lay down his life. Hallelujah. Give me 15 minutes and we'll be through. Fifth, Jesus has to be willing to lay down his life as a free will offering. He said, I freely lay down my life. No man taketh it from me. I freely lay it down on myself. Well, it's a free will offering. And there, Jesus loved what was the thing that held him to the cross, the nails, the spikes in his hand, the nails in his hand. No, the love, the love is what, hung, it is what uh, he hung on the cross, and what held him there was his love for you. He could have come down and called 12 legions, legions of angels and be delivered at any time he wanted to. 12 legions of angels, 6,000 in a legion, that's 72,000 angels. It only takes one to literally destroy a whole army. And then born, they were all dead men, the Midianites destroyed. Well, they could call 72,000 angels, 12 legions of angels to be delivered. But he didn't do it. Well, Jesus now, he said, my father's greater than I. The things concerning me have an end. He's praying to the father. Why? Because he's in our stead as a man. He's in under that law. That veil is still there. That law is still over, over Jesus until, until death will have no more dominion over him after he dies and sheds his own blood. He will say, Father, glorify thou me. The Father will say, I have glorified you and I will glorify you again. God's working salvation in and of himself alone. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto, unto himself. Somebody said, well, Christ is the man that suffered. Christ, first and foremost, is the Spirit of God. 1 Peter 1, verse 10 and 11, the Old Testament prophets searching what or what manner of time, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Christ that was in them. Can I get a witness in this house? Are you everybody asleep? Hallelujah to God. The Spirit of Christ that was in them did signify of the grace that should come unto us, uh, the sufferings of Christ. So Christ, the Spirit of God, is going to suffer in a body of flesh and blood as Christ. Not Christ, Jr., Christ, Amen. the Spirit of God. See, you, Christ is not only the anointed man. Christ is, first and foremost, the Spirit of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many times do we have to say? How many times do the preachers, how many times does the word of God have to come, even from the beginning, to say that Jesus Christ is the Lord Jehovah God Almighty? Not God Junior, God. Well, somebody said, you won't have no big churches that way. If God calls me home right now, be fine with me. Amen. Hallelujah unto God. I'll tell you, you have not resisted the blood, yes, striving against sin. 
Christ, first and foremost, does everybody believe that? Can I get an amen? That he is the Spirit of God. What's in you now? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Is that some flesh in you? That's the Spirit of God in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the Spirit of God himself. Christ is that Spirit. Amen. Now, with that said, Christ and the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. 1 Peter 1, verse 10 and 11. So who is a liar? 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is the spirit that made himself a body of flesh and blood as the Christ to die for the sins of the world and went back to his former glory. Amen. Came from God, went back to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that hath denied both the Father and the Son. Why? Because the Son is the Father revealed. The Son of God is the Father. I and my Father one. John 10, 30. He's the Father revealed. It's a manifested Father. It's a revealed Father. The image of the invisible God. The expressed image of His person. The brightness of His glory. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. John 14. Why sayest thou then, Philip? Have thou been so long time with you? Yes, hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then? Show us the Father. The words that I speak are not mine. The Father that dwelleth houses permanently in me. He doeth the works. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, who is a liar but he denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that has denied both the Father and the Son. He that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Why? Because the Son is the Father revealed. Amen. How hard is that? And that's what we have to bring, and that's what we're doing on the televisions out there for the last two months. And uh, we haven't made them yet. They are mad yet. They haven't uh, canceled us yet. But we're either going to make them sad, mad, or glad. You're either going to receive this word. Why would they kill you in the last days? Because they don't like you? Because you're American, you're white, you're black, you're yellow, you're, you're red, skin color? No. John 16, Jesus said, Behold, I have forewarned you that you should not be offended. For the time will come when they will live you after synagogues. Yea. The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he did God a service. That's what those stupid Muslims are doing right now. Islam's, you know, Muhammad. Islam, surrender. Muslim, one who surrenders. And they have to kill. So somebody said they're radical extremists. No, they're not radical extremists. They're Muslim. Surah 91 says you kill the infidel. That's in their Quran. So if they are Muslim... They have to kill you, unless they're not Muslim anyway. Just let it all go. But if they believe that Quran, they have to kill you. And that's the reason they just go out there, strap bombs, go in there and kill you. Jesus said, John 16, verse 3, These things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me, because I am the Father revealed. These things they will do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. These things they will do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. These things they, they do unto you because they do not know the Father and not known the Father nor me. John 16, 3. John 16 comes on down. He said the Holy Ghost approved the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father. Jesus there for three and one half years works progressive miracles. Even in raising the dead, the first one he does is Jairus' daughter. She'd been dead a few hours. We don't know how long. Immediately he goes and says, put him out. She's not dead. She's sleeping. They laughed him to scorn. They knew. They were professional mourners. They knew she was dead. Jesus rose her from the dead. Then he goes to the widow of Nain's son. Now this widow of Nain's son, see how it's progressing? Been dead a couple of days. Because they're burying him now. He's in that coffin, that beer going down the road. Jesus stops, has compassion on the, the widow, and said, Son, I say unto thee, arise. Presented him alive to his mother. And then we go to Lazarus. Now, four days dead. By this time, he stinketh. Well, it's progressing, progressing, progressing. Everything he did was for us to understand he was glorifying his own human, not for himself. He's always been God and always will be God. But for us, for us, 
After that, he raises Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Well, Jesus there, Father, glorify thou me. You know, I put that glory off to become this man, to as a man to bring all salvation back to you because I am he, you know. But, and then the days of his flesh, there is a differentiation. There is a, a separation there because man sinned and Jesus is uh, in the likeness of mankind, in the likeness of men. Therefore, he will have to take it from the, the gutter and bring it all the way back to God by himself. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The man Christ Jesus is going to suffer, be tempted in all points like as we are. He's going to have to pray fast. Father, glorify thou me. You know, I fasted, prayed, and all this stuff. They've, they've hated me without a cup. Glorify thou me. He said, I've glorified you. I've glorified you, and I will glorify you again. Why? Because the will of God and the will of the man is different. He has a will of a man. Father, not my will, but thy will. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus never did his own will, but always the will of the Father. I do, I can of my own self do nothing. What I see the Father, that's not looking with the eyes. <laughs> I see the Father, no, it's not seeing with the eyes. It is literally the intrinsic value, the essence of, I, can anybody know you? I don't mean know you and know you personally and hit the mark of what you are and every characteristic about you. That's an epigonosco. But Ido, E-I-D-O, means that I can only know me as only myself knows me. I know my thoughts. I know what, uh, uh, you know, if I get up there and I'm a 1,000 feet up in the air and I'm hanging out over a ledge, I know I've got a fear of height. Okay? Somebody say, well, perfect love casts out fear. Well, you go up there for me then. <laughs> Hallelujah. But that's just there. Well, yeah, I don't have a fear of flying. And Sister Lynette doesn't either now. But when we got on a plane flying to Africa, let me tell you something, son. When that plane took off, I thought she's going to I thought she's going to take that seat in front of her and yank it out of the floor. She had a grip on that thing. And then and after it was over with all that, she got back on that plane. She was laughing. She was looking that again. You know? Happy got that out of care of the world, you know. Right with, no problem, no problem flying now. Brad's laughing because we saw her over there. We, everybody on the plane was saying, oh, God, help me that. Because she was, she said, well, you see, only Nanette knew what she felt. I say, well, I know how you feel, but I really don't. Only nobody knows how you feel except you. That's Jesus. He knows the Father. That's an I-D-O, E-I-D-O. It means he has his essence. He knows him because he looks in the mirror. It's him. It's, it's only that you know. That is what I see the Father do, that I do. It's not looking at him and saying, I'll see him do it, so I'm going to do the same thing. No, no. It is a see in the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit, and only the Spirit. It's a Greek word called E-I-D-O-I-D-O. -I -D -O -I -D -O. And it means that only you know that you have it intrinsically, that you are it. That, and nobody knows God except Jesus. No man knoweth the Father, but no man knoweth the Son, but the Father. No man knoweth the Father, but the Son, and to whom He will reveal Him. Why? Because He is Him, and it's only through the revelation that by that Holy Ghost. The preacher can sit up here, preach, turn red in the face, blue, and fall out on the floor. Until the Holy Ghost quickens that to our spirit, we don't have nothing. Hallelujah. You have no need of any man to teach you. You have an unction from the Holy One. Jesus, Father, glorify them. He said, I've glorified you. I will glorify you again. He has so put his flesh under. He's not yet 33 and a half years old, hadn't gone to the cross yet. And they say unto him, have you seen it? You're not yet 50 years old. He had put his flesh through so much sufferings. They thought he was 50 years old. You're not yet 50 years old. You've seen our father Abraham. He said, for Abraham was I am. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. Why? Because he literally ate with the Lord before he went down and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, Jesus then is, goes up to a mountain apart and he's transfigured for them. Before Peter, James, and John. Transfigured. He has come to a place in glory of crucifying his flesh that the Lord God Almighty to the ones that can receive it, 
Peter, James, and John, that they will literally see his majesty. God will break through that flesh so much that Jesus' face shone as it were the sun and his raiment was glistening. And they saw his glory. And they were great there. They said, Peter said, Lord, let us build here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses. But he wished not what he said. The tabernacles is the tabernacles of God in the last day where the church of the living God will be transfigured to the point, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and to a perfect man. And you will bring this gospel, the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ into all the world, be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end will come. The difference that's going to be so great a difference, now listen to me, so great a difference than Pentecost. The Pentecostal reign we've been in for over 2,000 years since we received the Holy Ghost, which is Christ, which is Jesus in you. But now there's going to be such a radical change that only those, only those that, that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus will enter into this last day glory. That's Revelation 12. A moment clothed with the sun, a moon under feet, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. She cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Where church is going to go through a great tribulation, pain, that is uh, uh, in her sufferings to bring forth a man-child, caught up to God and to his throne, thrown power with God. That is the man, that is the son of man, where he is the head and we are the body of Christ. The son of man has nothing to do with flesh and blood. It's Jesus the head and we the body of Christ that have grown up into him in all things. It's not just having the spirit of God, understand. It is coming to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, caught up to God and to his throne. The woman in sorrow. If you look over there in, in Timothy, 1 Timothy, God says that uh, the woman was not deceived, but uh, Adam was not deceived being first formed, but Eve was deceived being in the transgression. Howbeit she shall be saved in childbearing. You mean a woman drops a child, she's saved? He's talking about the spiritual significance of the church bringing forth Christ in them to the fullness of the measure of the statue of Jesus. So where are we headed? What if I told you? What if I told you that God's looking at everybody here and his church throughout the whole world, and he, before he comes back, Acts 3, 20 and 21, for the heavens must receive Jesus to the times, until the times of the restitution of all things. So the heavens must receive Jesus until the times of restoration. What's the Elijah ministry for? Matthew 17, why do John the Baptist's disciples say that Elijah must truly first come and restore all things? Jesus said, Elijah truly first must come and restore all things. Why? Because the heavens are not going to are going to contain Jesus until they are. Amen. There has to be someone that foreruns Christ and said, "Make straight ye the paths of the Lord. Make your paths straight for the coming of our Lord God." Looking for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. There's a forerunner there, just as John the Baptist forerun Jesus' first coming, but he didn't do any miracles. So will the bride of Christ. In the spirit of Elijah, forerun his second coming. Let me ask you this. Was there a great radical change from the law to grace? Let me ask you another question. Every time that God raised and put higher glory, there was always an earthquake. Pentecost, there was a great shaking. Cloven tongues of fire, fire appeared and sat on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Cloven tongues of fire appeared. They could see those tongues of fire appear and set on them. How big of a radical change was it from, from Jesus Christ, our death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, unto Pentecost? Scribes and Pharisees had literally Bible thumpers. They had, they had all that law they'd studied. The mission, all the different things that they had. Yet Jesus is dying on the cross, and they don't even know that's the Lamb of God. At the very time of the preparation of the Passover, in the natural law, Jesus fulfilling that law must have his hand spread there because he's fulfilling all the law. 
So on the 14th day of the first month, Jesus has his hands nailed to the cross, and he's dying there. Exactly on Passover. The preparation where they kill the Paschal lamb, Jesus dies. You want to cut, uh, cut that air down a little? Now, give me just 15 minutes and we're going to be through. Am I boring y'all? How big of a radical change will it be? How big of a radical change will it be before we got it, we can hang beef in here. How big of a radical change will it be before this Pentecost movement that we're in now, 2,000 years of Pentecost, until tabernacles, the Feast of Trumpets. The next, the next move of God is in the Feast of Trumpets. How radical a change will that be? They, the Pharisees and all them, the Jews did everything they could to kill the church. Paul, Saul of Tarsus, had letters there to persecute the church. And God literally, you know what happened on the Damascus Road. So great a change. What if I were to tell you that in this next move of God, not the second advent, the Lord come from heaven, the sent from the name with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ rising first, but this everlasting gospel being preached into all the world for a witness in all nations, then the end will come, that he will give power unto his two witnesses. Somebody said those two men. No, they're not. Where did it say they're two men? It did not say they're two men. It said these are the two olive trees and the two golden candlesticks. That's the church. But they have the spirit of Elijah on them and the spirit of Moses on them. Just like John the Baptist, they asked him point blank, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not. But when they asked Jesus, why did they say Elijah must truly first come and restore all things? Well, the heavens must contain Jesus until it does, Acts 3, 20 and 21. He ain't coming back until it is. So there's a ministry of Elijah. Is Elijah going to come back here and do it? Somebody said, he never died. I'm going to show you he did. Somebody said, no, he did. Yes, he did. Somebody said Enoch didn't die. Who said he was translated? But it did. no man hath ascended up to heaven. I said, yeah, Elijah did and Enoch did. No, he didn't. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Case closed. If you look in Hebrews 11, it said, These all died, having never received the promise. Enoch's mentioned. He's translated, yeah, he shall not taste of death. That literally means that he went forward into another era of glory, another era of time. There is no person that has ever went to heaven without, without the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, somebody said, thief on the cross did. You better take another look at it. Amen. The thief is dying on the cross. The other one's railing on Jesus. Did Jesus even look at him? Didn't so much as look at him. People rail on you, let him go. It's not them. The devil taketh them at will. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood, against fits, vows, powers, rules of darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Let them rave on. If they had called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call you Beelzebub? Don't even waste your time and effort on it. Don't get mad. Don't get sad. But be glad. For great is your reward in heaven. Hallelujah. Don't let them get to you. When they get to you, they got you. The devil says, gotcha. <laughs> Why? Because you gave in to it. Don't do that. Well, Jesus, literally our Lord God himself, as he, he told the disciples of John, Elijah must truly first come and restore all things. Then he kicks it back and said, but Elijah has already come. He spoke in the future, and then he spoke, he has a past already come. Why? Because they'd already cut off the head of John the Baptist. Put it in a charger. What I'm trying to tell you is that God is getting us prepared for the work of the ministry. The ministry of Jesus Christ to carry it to the whole world. That the Lord God himself will have a people that will come and caught up to God and to his throne. These are the two olive trees, which are the two golden candlesticks, that they're given power for 42 months, time, times and a half, three and a half years. Why? Because Jesus, he said in Daniel 9, 27, that he will confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's a heptad. 
a week of years. But Jesus was cut off in the midst of the week, but not for himself. Isaiah said, and who shall declare his generation? The generation that shall be counted for the seed. Therefore, there remains another three and a half year Jesus' ministry for the work of the ministry, which God has been working on in the church for literally over 2,000 years in Pentecost to get us ready for the coming of the Lord God Almighty. What if I was to tell you that it's going to be such a radical change from Pentecost that many, if they do not know this word, will literally say it's not of God that these people are of the devil. Why would they say that? Because they have not known the Father nor me, Jesus said. Because Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration. There's a time before the cross that the body of Christ will be transfigured. That God will do such a move of God that it will translate us, uh, it will transform us, uh, not literally flesh becoming spirit and spirit becoming flesh, but a higher glory in the church than she's ever experienced heretofore. This is the Revelation 12 woman bringing forth a man-child, caught up to God and to his throne. 